see you again too. I'm doing well. And yourself? Not too bad. It's starting to get warm here in uh, Los Angeles. It's been kind of an unusually not warm beginning of the year here, but it's starting to warm up now. Sunshine, so things are things are good. Now we don't want it to get too hot. So. <laughs> it's never. It's never. It's either we're bitching because it's too cold, or we're going to be complaining because it's too hot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Still- no, it's actually pretty humid over here. There's a heat warning. Uh, yesterday was really hot, okay. uh, but it's it's all good. I don't I don't mind it. I mean, I we're kind of accustomed to bitter cold or super hot, so it is what it is. You know, you take it one day at a time. Well, yeah, the, the cold and the wet. I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a, I think that's everybody in California. Yeah, the first thirty years of my life I spent in you know in the UK and. Uh, I got my fill of cold, wet weather and cold, wet winters. So I always feel kind of cheated when it when it gets cold or wet in California. It's like I travel six thousand miles to get away from that rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. No, well, thank you so much, man, for joining. Um, appreciate it. My pleasure, as uh, always. Uh, we we chatted about this uh, uh, in person about your last feature uh, animated film Sherlock uh, Gnomes and uh, you know just sort of want to expand on that I got I saw the film just this morning um, and uh, was pleasantly not surprised but in based on the reviews I was kind of like because I you know you and I talked about it and then I saw the reviews I had no idea it was that bad the you know the Rotten Tomatoes Oh yeah, um, and, and twenty seven percent, something like that. Yeah, even the audience score was pretty low. So I I watched it and I didn't think. I mean, it that's I I just, honestly think it should be around seventy seventy five percent. Like just based on what I saw. I mean, it had great. First of all, the animation I loved the animation and the characters and the storytelling, and it was very very fast paced and witted. And one thing that I really liked liked about it that is lacking nowadays, even from Pixar films, there were days when Pixar and DreamWorks, I don't know much about DreamWorks right now, like maybe I saw Puss in Boots. There were days when they were used to be humor for kids and adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case with Pixar anymore. I think it's, I, I've seen a couple of the recent Pixar films and I, it just wasn't for adults, it was for kids. Um, and this, on the contrary, was different. It had that fine balance, like Shrek did. Um, so, you know, just to kind of let you know that it, <laughs> I'm sure other people have told you that it, 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 it is, it is a decently good movie. Um, I just don't know why it, you know, can. I will take a decently good movie. That, that's way better than any of the uh, critical reactions that. Uh, um, you know, we ha- we had so decently good movie. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll take that. Thank you. Perfect. Well, tell me about the process. How you started that uh, film? How you got on board? I know we we kind of ended talking about Kung Fu Panda, the first one, and then just sort of your journey from there, leading up to uh, this project. Well, there was a sort of weird period of about. I mean, it was seven years between Kung Fu Panda and me getting. Um, Sherlock Holmes and and you know the reason I got Sherlock Holmes was it was the first green lit movie that I you know I, I was offered in in seven years I I'd, I'd spent seven years developing lots of projects and being attached to lots of things uh, I don't think any of the things that I've been attached to that subsequently went on and churned through other directors have ever seen the light of day like you know Masters of the Universe I believe that's actually happening but. You know, after I left Masters of the Universe, it churned through a whole bunch of directors. I was on, you know, a whole number of projects, uh, a Fraggle Rock movie that that still hasn't got made, an adaptation of Grant Morrison's We Three, um, The Minotaur Takes a Cigarette Break, lots and lots of things. And basically, those development deals uh, pay, paid my bills just for the seven years after Kung Fu Panda while I was trying to get a, a, another feature, but it, it wasn't, I, you know, I had many things that I was developing. Normally I, my brain's just about big enough to hold about five or six different projects 
at one time. So I was juggling like five or six, knowing that either all or most of them would fall apart, you know, and then you'd have to replace them with a different project. Um, right. And it turned out that Sherlock Gnomes was the, you know, the, the first real movie um, that I was offered after seven years, you know, in it got greenlit, I think, in, you know, May 2015, I think. We were in production in August 2015. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working on it since I first met the producers, Steve Hamilton Shaw and Carolyn Soper, I think in 2012 or 13. And they had originally been trying to raise the money independently. Um, and that was a tiresome process of a, of a few years where they would, you know, I would go out to pitch meetings with them and, and uh, you know, they would sort of tell me they, you know, they had like two thirds of the financing and then we're waiting on the last bit and then they would get that bit and then one of the other investors would fall out. And it was this house of cards that kept sort of building up and collapsing and building up and collapsing. And then eventually, I think after a couple of years, they made the choice to you know, do the one-stop shopping deal of go to a major studio. Um, Paramount uh, was interested in the project, and and they, you know, it became a Paramount picture that they funded and distributed. But you know, I'd been working on it for a couple of years before it was greenlit in 2015, along with right. a lot of other. It was not, you know, it was not the only project on my plate. It was one of six, I think, at the time. Um, right. Another this one other one was the Ark and the Aardvark, which if you check my IMDb page is still about to come out, although, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, I haven't, haven't had any news on that for, for a long time. So, you know, it wasn't, it, it, Sherlock Holmes was not the only thing I was working on. It was, it, it was the one that got greenlit. And, and my rule has always been, you know, first project to greenlit, to greenlight wins. So, that was the reason I I did it was because it was a real movie. It was going to happen. It had a you know real director salary attached to it, which I you know could do with after seven years of sort of scraping by on um, you know development deals. You know which which do not pay very well. Um, so that was the reason. I, it was partly financial because I mean, you know, it was the job security for a, about three years and you know, on, a, on a reasonable in you know, a salary. Um, and it was a real project as opposed to a maybe project. So that was why I did. Now, in terms of the treatment that you, or was the script already fully written or was there a lot of uh, different um, versions that you went through as you came on the direct, as a director? There was, there was an idea about the film, which I rejected either right. rightly or rightly. Um, uh, and the, the, the idea uh, 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 when I was first presented with it was that there was a gnome who thought he was Sherlock, um, Sherlock Gnomes, but he wasn't. He was, he was deluded, you know. Um, so it, it, had, it had some elements of, you know, some of the sort of, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes kind of comedy films, you know. Um, um, like, is it, is it? The George C. Scott film, you know, they might be giants where where, where he thinks he's sure. Right. Anyway, it's a bit more like that. He wasn't this guy wasn't, at least in the treatment, it wasn't a script, it was a treatment, as I remember. Um, it was a it was a sort of a gnome who was confused and, and imagined himself as as Sherlock, but wasn't. And I just didn't find that particularly interesting, you know, because I I I I actually really love the character of, of, of Sherlock Holmes and you know when I was uh, at school um, you know we had a very Edwardian uh, kind of boys own school library I went you know I went to a, an old boys school in, in Sussex and they had this you know H. Ryder Haggard and, and Rudyard Kipling-esque type library and uh, right. and and Sherlock Holmes and, and um, Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan were like my two favorite characters because you know Tarzan's all physical and Sherlock's all mental. Well, not mm. actually all very good at, um, you know, he's, he's, he's actually very athletic, but, but uh, so he was a very favorite character. And I just didn't, I didn't, I, I couldn't really connect with, you know, a, a film about an idiot, you know, uh, who, who was a, a bumbling, you know, 
fool who thought he was brilliant but but wasn't i didn't find that a, a, a particularly interesting challenge so I, I i thought it would be what i was more i you know i pitched i think my pitch to the producers was something like why don't we make a real you know sherlock holmes venture adventure but at 12 inches tall you know mm. uh, and and the sort of the backstory that we sort of came up with was that you know the the, the gnome factory that that makes um that makes garden gnomes and did a speciality line of famous you know parodies of you know of parodies of famous sort of figures and 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 that Sherlock gnomes would have been one of the puns that they would have come up with um uh, I can't remember what the other ones were you know none of this is in the film of course but mm -hmm. that's how we imagined that you know a garden gnome factory might have made a Sherlock gnomes as a as a joke speciality you know gnome and if they if they had they would have gone with the cliche you know look of the deer stalker and and uh, and uh, um you know, magnifying glass and all the sort of the sort of the tropes that, that we sort of associate with Sherlock, which actually aren't uh, in, in Conan Doyle. Um, so that was kind of how we came, uh, you know, justified that idea. Um, and so that was a, that was sort of the spin, rightly or wrongly, that that I chose to put on it, and that the producers accepted, and that we we ended up pitching. Now. When you directed your first feature, which was with Mark Osborne, you know, it was a duo director uh, on Kung Fu Panda. And then here you are working on this film as a director. Um, were old habits still there or was it nothing against working with anybody else? Sometimes those things work out really great, actually quite rarely. But when they do, they work out really, really well. Uh, sometimes they don't. Was there something that you missed from the previous experience or vice versa? Uh, I, I think the only thing that I, you know, I, I, I expect Mark would probably say the same thing if you ask me about his experience on directing Little Prince, you know, that it was sort of easier because you have one less person whose views you have to sort of take into consideration as the less compromise about what you want to do yeah then you know the nice thing about directing with someone is that it's a lonely position you know you're sort of captain of the ship and and you know you have to be yeah. in charge to make the decisions and and keep everything going um you know it, it it it's it's nice to have someone to confide in who gets it you know when it gets tough um, yeah, and that was that was true with Mark on 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 Panda. You know, we had each other when it was when things were sort of you know challenging or whatever, right. um, or when one of us you know uh, was just tired, physically tired. You know, and our energy was down, and we had a lot of stuff to do. You know, it was it was all it was nice knowing that that somebody had your back and could get you through your bad day, and then you would do the same for them. And when you're solo, yeah. you don't have you know maybe you have to you have to get yourself up whether you know you want you feel like it or if you're sick or you know exhausted or whatever you, you know you have to lead the parade um but in but creatively it, you know i'm sure mark would agree it was easier you know because you're only just you're the only person who you're checking in with about whether you you know want to do something or believe it's right is yourself you don't have right. to sort of idea to the producers and to the studio and you know, eventually to the crew but in terms of you know um, a direction you know it's being solo is easier yeah no I, I i completely i completely understand sometimes it is like you said the confinement and you know when you're maybe having a bad day somebody's that you can count on somebody else yeah. who's literally you know looking for the betterment of the film just as much as you are yeah and uh, and and one one thing so here, here when i was watching it i saw a lot of cool stuff in there that really clicked with me like i said the adult humor um the cross-cultural you know references and all that stuff like in one shot i think in the in the beginning you did um 
it, it appeared that way at least that there was a tribute to Indiana Jones and then there was you know Chucky and all that stuff just very subtly and it was that something that you were I know it's, it was in the script after it was done and everything but were those things sort of sometimes added or taken out later on when you guys were in the process or was it like very much to the script at all times once it's fine? No, 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 we would, you know, we were always kind of, you know, I like, I like Easter eggs, you know, if they don't hurt, um, you know, the narrative, if, uh, if you're not drawing too much attention to the Easter egg, you know, if it's just there and it, and it, and it's something for people who get it. And if, if people don't get it, it doesn't matter, if, you know, the story. Yeah. So, you know, um, it was something we would, you know, I, there were there were things that I definitely wanted to put in. I mean, the, the most the most um, clearly planted, which is I don't make any apology for, is a sort of a, is a sort of a tribute, thank you, whatever you want to call it, to Ray sure. Harry as Carol Zeman. So very definitely planted that. I wanted people to see that and. And if people didn't understand what those names meant, then you know that was okay. And if people were intrigued, I hope they would go and you know Google it or Wikipedia and find out who Ray Harryhausen and Carol Zeman were. But I just wanted to do it as an acknowledgement that you know I wouldn't be directing anything if it probably wasn't for the inspiration of you know those two sure. characters. So I, I definitely you know petitioned to add that you know. That little moment in but we you know we were always looking for you know yeah. things that we thought were funny as long as as long and, and acknowledgements of either things that um you know we liked or we felt were sort of inappropriate or nods to other things that had meant something to us and as i said as long as it, we didn't feel it was uh too overt or or pulled focus from the main story you know we could tuck it in we, we we would yeah makes sense one thing animation i find can get away with and it's so funny i saw uh dial the destiny last night yeah me too and, <laughs> yeah okay there you go um we can go on our subject i just talked about it twice today to two different people but anyways uh, did you like did you not like it not really no you didn't okay. No. I I, re no. I really liked it. Maybe it was just because I hated the last one so much, and was so offended by the la you know the Crystal Skull that maybe my expectations were set so low after that that this one was like oh it's it you know it's a nice wrap up. Um, I I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. But it comes sure. Kung Panda, the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull related story. Just as a sorry sidebar, then we'll get back to your question. Mark and I um, had to go do some press. We were in Minneapolis, uh, I think, and we were doing press for Kung Fu Panda, and there was a screening, and we did a you know an introduction, a Q and A, and then that night they were going to show uh, a late night you know pre preview or premiere or whatever it was in Minneapolis uh, of Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And it was I didn't think it went on at about you know, 11 o'clock or something like that, you know, and, mm. and we were, you know, we were fans where you said, oh, can we stay after our presentation and see the movie? And they were like, oh, yeah, sure, great. Yeah, but we were exhausted and, you know, partly it was the end of the film in you know, like four years of that, but also we've been traveling or whatever. So, so we were all really excited when the film started and, and like almost, almost immediately when I was looking at, you know, I might felt my heart sinking and going, oh, no, this is, this is awful. This is all everything that I loved about, you know, the original Raiders, all the sort of all the practical you know, stunts and locations. Mm -hmm. It's all, you know, CGI crap, you know, and and so my heart was sinking and I kept falling asleep and waking up and falling asleep, and waking up because I was so tired. And at some point I must have nodded off. And when I woke up, it was when when the alien was there. And I thought I'd slept through into another movie. I, I, I thought <laughs> I must have been for hours, and they had a, a, another feature after Indiana Jones, some kind of alien, you know, spaceship movie. Because I was completely confused, like what the hell? You know, and, and then I suddenly realized there was an alien in, in the 
end. And I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> furious. Um, but there was a moment where I was just completely discombobulated and I'm like, what film is this? It's, it's, you know, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I hated that film. Absolutely hated it. No, it's, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because when I saw that film, I didn't like it at all either. And then um, past few weeks, I've been sort of with my kids watching all the Indiana Jones movies just to kind of give them the background and context. So when we go to see this one and I saw Kingdom of Crystal Skull after whatever, 14 years or something. And it wasn't as bad as it was back then for some reason. Yeah, it had problems and everything. But now after watching the last night, the Dial of Destiny, for me, the only thing that worked were the last half an hour. That's it. Okay. I, I I love the last half an hour. And there were some moments. I mean, the Morocco sequence was really, really good. Um, but I just felt that my question was leading up to that point was in animation, a lot of characters can work because it's animation. You can get yeah. away with it. In live action, which was going to be my point last night, I, you know, there were so many characters that didn't have any need to, to the story, at least in my opinion, and that mm -hmm. doesn't work. So, it, 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 Are you talking about characters who sort of were just sort of re reprise, just so that they could have their no, carry no, 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 no. I wasn't even talking about. I think Salha was wasted. Like they could have yeah. had him go on a journey with Indiana. I think that would have yeah. been really funny. Um, yeah. I thought uh, Antonio's character was had no point. Yeah. Um, even the little kid was okay. I mean, I know they were trying to pull out short round, but it was not even close um, yeah. to that. But again, those are just my opinions. I mean, I've, Hello. I've... so did the Karen Allen? You know, that was good. Yeah, I thought that was very, you know, that was very nicely done and genuinely emotional and yeah, and, you know, and nice. You know, a, a, a happy ending for Indiana that I was happy that he got that the film got, and I think James Mangold, great director. I mean, he's oh, he, to... I, he's amazing. I loved Logan. I loved Ford versus Ferrari. What yeah. I would have loved to see, I, I tell you, I don't know if you remember that se sequence, and we're going off topic. Sorry, his three ten to you know remake of three ten to humor. I think is yeah, that terrific. was that was great. That was for the Habilis too. What really got me interested and peaked and i wish they had gone in that route again i'm not a you know indiana jones screenwriter or anything but when he talked about his son on the boat mm -hmm. you know what, what i thought that moment i'm like it would have been great if the story was about him trying to undo what happened and then mm -hmm. realizing that maybe he should go back to his you know uh wife and I think that to me would have been great, but hey, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just, you know, wish, wish, maybe I'll like it in 20 years, who knows? But uh, I had the a, last. I had a good Sorry? time and, and I was happy. I, I felt it was a good send off for that character. Uh, I thought Phoebe Waller-Bridge was great. You know, she I was fabulous. She was terrific. Um, yeah. So I'm very happy, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the film and, and, and now, there are four Indiana Jones films I can I can I can watch that that make a complete story if you just leave out Kingdom of the Skull. <laughs> it's so interesting that people have people are pretty much unanimously in agreement with the with the first three ones, but fourth and fifth one I find this it's kind of like torn between. I, I, um, yeah. I, I expect there must be fans of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull for all the reasons that I hate it. You know, I mean, there are, been... but but it's not like the first three, you know, Last no. Crusade, Temple but, of Doom. But, but maybe there are people who love the fact that there's, you know, aliens and the flying saucer in King of the Crystal Skull, you know, which is for me, that was, that was, you know, where the, you know, you, you know, yeah, I, no, I, I know, I, I jump the shark is now to be what, what's this, the, the thing about the fridge, you know, in nuke the fridge. Oh, you know? God, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> so that that, that was the biggest turnoff for me. I'm like, if he can survive the nuclear blast yeah. by some coincidence, the the fall of the bridge would have broken his neck ten times yeah. or hundred times. Yeah. So you know that film that was, as I said, you know when I was watching it and my heart started to sink. That was that was when my heart started to sink. It was yeah. like, oh, 
know, all the rules of logic have gone out the window. We haven't even got going. Um, yeah. So but going back... Sorry, go, go, go on. <laughs> go on. <laughs> no, so that film jumped the shark and nuked the fridge. You know, it, it nuked the That's fridge. True. And jumped That's the shark, true. brought aliens in. It, you know, it broke all the rules of what I had loved about the first three movies, you know, so... I, I would love to see if there's a director's cut for um, the new Indiana yeah. Jones, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I mean, sometimes these things, as you know more than I do, you know, the studio and all that stuff, there's so many chefs in the kitchen. I, I, you know, I think as a, I, I spoke to James Mangold mm. when, when I was working with Henry Selleck on um, uh, at Twitching Images in San Francisco. And right. uh, we, I think, I can't remember exactly, but we... We reached out to him, um, uh, and you know he wasn't sort of the director that he is now. He was he was about uh, um, he. I think it was Copland that he was working on when we spoke to him. And yeah, oh, he did Copland. When we when we called him, I had a I had a conversation with him, and he was he was he had either just turned it in or was about to. But but that was the current project that he was opening. Anyway, I just wanted to say that James Mangle was the nicest and most generous person. I'm sure he gave he gave us a ton of, of time. He, he he was really kind and, and and helpful. So you know, and then he went on to make you know freaking amazing movies. So uh, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a <laughs> big James Mangle fan. No, he I look I I didn't even know Copland was made by him because I remember when it came out I absolutely loved it for Sylvester Stallone to be in that kind of a role was like unheard of at that time. Well, what um, I remember is that he was upset because he had written the climax of Copland. Um I don't I, you know if you remember in the in the film, you know, um, yeah. they, they deafen Sylvester Stallone's character by firing a gun near his ear. And so the final shootout, as written in his script, as he told told me on his phone call, was supposed to be played out in kind of silence. So it was a, it was supposed to be a gunfight where you couldn't hear the gunshots because Sylvester Stallone's character couldn't hear them. Maybe of like course. a high sort of tinnitus whine, but no no sort of pyrotechnic booms and things. And he was upset because uh, Harvey Weinstein had overruled him on that and they put in, you know, and sort of firefight sound effects, which he thought ruined the whole, you know, point of, of the climax of something he thought was very interesting. And so there's a director's cut of Copland's, you know, that should be released where <laughs> there are no gunshots in the in the final shootout. And that would be much closer to his original vision, uh, as he as he told us on the phone call. I, I would love to see that. And I think he's a genius filmmaker. Um, yeah. uh, I, I'm really looking forward to whatever he's got unfolding next. I mean, I, I truly believe he's at the level of Christopher Nolan and Quentin Tarantino and the yeah. names like that. He, um, he's absolutely great. He can make those great big movies and make them really... Human. Yeah, human he humanizes them. But, but with great yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Uh, so humanity. tell me about... Um, Sherlock Gnomes, like once the film, like the problems that you were going through in the production as you were about to sort of unwind, uh, as opposed to, as a, as you're about to wrap up a production and uh, leading up to the release date. Well, uh, we had a bunch of challenges on that film because we we had we had like five. Regime changes at Paramount at the time we made the film over three years. So we were greenlit by, um, uh, sorry, it's the Adam Goodman greenlit us. And then, you know, he sort of left the company some, you know, like a few weeks after we got greenlit. And then we went through, I think, five different, you know, people that we had to show our work to um, over the course of three years. And, and every you know every time we'd get used to one that they they'd be fired or and leave and we'd just have to start again with somebody else and so there was this big churn of of, of sort of the heads of studio you know as I said five different ones um, or at least five different people that we were reporting to and that 
that was definitely chatting, you know, that, that, that meant, you know, our boat was zigzagging all over the place because we'd been doing, we'd follow one set of, you know, cues from the, from one person and they'd be gone and we'd get another a different set and we'd do that and then they'd be gone, we, you know, so it was a crazy clown car, you know, sort of driving all over the road. That was challenging. That was very challenging, you know. Um, making the film wasn't challenging, you know, I had a great crew, um, you know, we used Micross animation um, in France and we set up a satellite studio at uh, MPC, uh, Moving Picture Company in London, you know, and that was where we were, we were based. Uh, we mm. used, you know, we had a, you know, we had our own sort of satellite Micross studio at MPC, but we were also using big Micross over in Paris, sort of, so we'd go over uh, work with them. They were great, you know, the crew in London was was great. So actually making the film, uh, you know, with the people was not, you know, it was no more no more or less difficult making an animated film anywhere. Um, and we had a really great crew that I, I enjoyed going into work with every day. You know, uh, it, it was, it was, it was the challenging, you know, who are we trying to make happy this week? Uh, that was, that was, you know, that was hard. And how, as a captain of the ship, you know, during that five regime changes and everybody coming in with their own demands and their own politics and all that stuff, as a captain of the ship, how do you steer your crew and your ship? Like, do you have a meeting every time there is a big, you know, some sort of a demand well, that this needs? The, the head of, you know, you, you know, I would with, with, you know, primarily with Steve Hamilton Shaw and Karen Sopa, the producers, you know, we right. would, we would huddle like, okay, what the hell do we do now? You know, whenever we would get sort of some, you know, conflicting directions or, you know, a new set of things that kind of were in, you know, it sort of ran against what we'd already been working on, you know, trying to resolve them and, and, and trying to keep making the film that we had pitched and that we had got greenlit, um, while also taking on board all these new, you know, needs and requirements and demands, you know. Um, you know, but it was our job not to pass that down as much as we could to the crew. The crew don't need to know about that stuff. So, you know, they need just need to do, you know, the job that we, we've given them. So our job was, you know, we were trying to, you know, make the film that we thought it should be and believed in, you know, while, you know, trying to allow for, you know, some input from, from new, you know, from sort of new regimes, but without allowing that new input to sort of derail everything that we'd been working on for years. Um, you know, it was, it was, it was hard. I kid you not. Yeah. And, and dealing with the, uh, you know, marketing and promotion of the film, because that's, I mean, you have so many films in the world, not just animation or studio based, that could be the most incredible films, but we never hear about them because either they're not marketed properly or they're just marketed wrong, like in a completely wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, did Sherlock Gnomes go through anything like that? Oh, it was, uh, I have to, I have to say that was, that was the, the, we really, I mean, well, I don't, I can only speak for myself. I hate the way the film is marketed, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, look, I'm fine with people looking at the, at something that you make and going, well, I don't like that, you know, if you actually look at the thing. But I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, people who who have negative feelings about Sherlock Holmes are to do with the trailer and the marketing, which, you know, made it out to be a, a different movie than, than we were actually, you know, making. Um, I mean, in fact, you know, the, the, the trailer, but you can still unfortunately find whenever you look up Sherlock Gnomes on IMDb, you know, about 50% of that trailer was custom animation only for the trailer that the marketing department, you know, made us animate only for the trailer because they wanted it to, they wanted that movie. We weren't making that movie, the movie that had fart jokes and, you know, no ship Sherlock, you know, puns. So that stuff that's in the trailer was never intended to go in the film. 
And we had to animate that to please the marketing department. And I've never heard of a, you know, of a film that had to animate special scenes for the trailer that were never intended to be in the film. But that trailer turned a lot of people off. I mean, we we thought it completely, you know, people may still have not liked the movie, but at least don't like it for the film that it actually is, as opposed to, right. to the film that it isn't. And I think we got a lot of negative reaction when that trailer dropped. A lot of people quite rightly said they thought it was crass and stupid and the lowest common denominator, all the things that we were, you know, trying very much to, um, you know, avoid doing with Sherlock. You know, I mean, rule one when we started Sherlock was, was there was going to be no fart jokes. And what's the, what's the biggest thing in the trailer? It's that stupid fart joke, which was, you know, that was written by the marketing department. It was not, not ever part of the script and was never supposed to be part of the film. So, you know, it, it just shows you, you know, you can have the best intentions in the world and they can still get scuppered. So, yes, I'm not a fan of the marketing. I, I don't think it represented the film. You know, uh, and I, there's no way of knowing whether the film would have performed any better or worse with different marketing, um, you know, it didn't, it performed about half as well as I think the original uh, Nomeo and Juliet and certainly got much, much worse uh, reviews. Uh, would any of that changed if, we did, if we'd had better marketing that more closely represented the film? No way of knowing, I would hope so, but maybe it wouldn't have made any difference, I don't know. Maybe you should use the dial of the destiny to find out. <laughs> 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 nah, it's all in the past, you know. You, you you know you do the best you can. So, I know, I know. Uh, and then you move on, uh, and that's all you can do. You know? I mean, and uh, you know, as I, I sort of said to people when I was making Sherlock Holmes, when I was making Kung Fu Panda, they both felt exactly the same to me. You know, day to day going in, working with uh, the your crew. You know, it was as hard work and as fun and as enjoyable on Sherlock as it was on Kung Fu Panda. You know, it wasn't. And, you know, everybody who worked on the film uh, in terms of, you know, the crew, the MPC and Micros, you know, we all believed it, it believed in it. We all thought we were doing, you know, something good. We were all trying to do something good. We all worked really hard. Uh, and we had, you know, but you don't know. I mean, you know, when, as I, I told you, when Kung Fu Panda came out, we didn't know it was going to be a success. It wasn't like we all felt it was some some guaranteed, you know, big hit. You know, I, I was terrified it would make less than 15 million on its opening weekend. And the studio wanted 20 and we ended up, you know, making like over 60. So that was a surprise, you know, a, a good one. Um, you know, when Sherlock came out, I had no idea. It, was, you know, could either have been, you know, a, a, a big success and celebrated as being something good, or, or you know, the opposite. And sadly, it was it was the opposite. But making it didn't. It wasn't like when we were making Sherlock, we went, oh, this is this, yeah, this is the unsuccessful film. You know, yeah, <laughs> this yeah is of course. A, this is the one that's going to flop, and, and everybody's going to write bad reviews. But we, 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 had, you know. You have no control over that stuff and you have no idea. So you just do the best you can every day. And as long as you finish up a movie and everybody can look at each other in the eye and go, you know, we, you know, we did our, the best work we were capable of in the, you know, the time and circumstances allowed to us. That's all you can do. And if the world likes it, great. If, it does, if the world doesn't like it and you go, oh, well, then you move on to the next thing. That That is so true because, you know, Everybody, um, whether you're in animation, live action, documentary, whatever scene you're in making films, aside from telling a story that you want to tell, there is a big element that a lot of people who watch films, you and I, everybody else, you know, that the experience that you have making that film. Um, you know, I was talking to Simon. He said it very, really, really well about working on uh, Ma Mars Need Moms um, is that he, I think he was offered Kung Fu to Panda 2 by Jeffrey Katzenberg. And uh, he turned it down just to go uh, for Mars Needs Mom. And despite how it turned out with critics and box office, he wouldn't change that for anything because the experience that he had with the group of people that he worked with. And same, 
same thing same thing that you said right and yeah. it's it's just that you build this family and and this experience that you, that stays with you and the you know the movie comes out and goes you know whether it goes through the roof or tanks whether it's right or wrong that's a different story but it's that experience that you have as a human being and how it makes you grow to do something different and yeah. maybe even you know better well, you know, uh, exactly right. I mean, the whole reason I like making things, you know, and particularly animation, is that collaboration with a lot of, you know, really smart, really fun, really creative people that, that, that hopefully surprise you every day by doing better work than, than you had imagined and you know, maybe inspiring you to do better work yourself and to try and, you know, push harder and do better that you know and i've worked on you know like really crummy low budget commercials and and and, and sort of low budget industrial thing you know films and you know all that kind of stuff that you sort of you, you churn through and and you know those could still be really good experiences because of the people you worked with so the thing itself may have just been some industrial film that you tried to make as good as it possibly could be given whatever time and money you had available but the process of making it even if you were in some kind of crummy studio in some horrible industrial you know wasteland which i've you know been in but if you're working with really fun people then that's a good experience you know and and yeah. you know, if you have, you get you get the you know you get the trifecta of you know the you know the the fun experience of working with a great crew and you make something you know that you're proud of that, that is really good that's a that's a success i mean you know that that does happen but it's very rare uh you know normally if you just get if you can get one out of the three then you're you know you, you're lucky and the one that you're most likely to get is is uh working with a bunch of people that you you, you enjoy and enjoy coming to work with every day Absolutely. And that sort of led you after Sherlock Gnomes came out, um, you know, your path working on a project that was something that you, uh, a short animated film. Talk about that to me, please. Well, you know, weirdly, it may be that the best thing that came out of, you know, the, the failure of Sherlock Gnomes was Middle Watch, the, the short film that, that I made, you know, um, and the reason it got made was because of the failure of, you know, Sherlock Holmes. I was, you know, I'd spent, you know, probably five years of my life on on uh, Sherlock Holmes, three years in production, and it came out and disappeared over a weekend, basically, you know, got slammed by critics and did terrible box office. And so, you know, you spent five years on something and then, you know, you know by by you know, Sunday evening, you're a donkey and nobody wants to talk to you, you know? <laughs> and so I was depressed, certainly, you know, for a good couple of months and, and my very kind and, and uh, forgiving wife allowed me two months of sort of grumpily moping about the house, feeling sorry for myself and, and, and getting underfoot and just being in general dragged to everybody. And after a couple of, uh, of months of this she basically got fed up and told me you know why don't you just go and make a short film and i think you know i was sort of you know like <laughs> easy for you to say make your film. So, <laughs> childish you know immature reaction like that and then as sometimes happens you know like the next day i think literally it was the next day while just poking her around on the internet in a dispirited kind of a way i found what would become the inspiration for um middle watch uh, the short film that i made and you know that started this process of working on it for the next four years uh, or three and a half years um you know from 11 which what ended up being in the like an 11 minute uh, an animated film um that eventually got nominated for a bafta so you know from from a, a conversation with an exasperated spouse to you know, being at the the BAFTAs, you know, being being one of three nominated films, um, only happened because of you know, because Sherlock had been, you know, such a, a so unsuccessful and the and the reviews had been so bruising. 
So if Sherlock had been, you know, even a moderate success, I probably wouldn't have felt you know, the mm. need or the desire to make the short. You know, I'd have maybe rolled onto some other kind of you know commercial thing. You know, right. um, I may I may not have ever made middle watch or ever felt the need to or you know whatever. So, and the and, and the the thing that <laughs> only. You know, this is sound, this is sound monumentally stupid, but yeah, I didn't actually realize until the end of Making Middle Watch, which is a film about uh, somebody suffering from, from PTSD who has an experience that ends up opening them up and healing them. And it wasn't until I finished the film that I realized, oh, I just made a film about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made a film about someone who was broken and 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 closed down and needed to be opened up and healed, and and the film did that. <laughs> so uh, you know, but I didn't realize it while I was making it. You know, um, uh, so you know, it, it, it that's probably the for me that's probably the best thing uh, about Sherlock Holmes was <clears throat> the fact that it it's led directly to making middle watch it's funny that you know i i genuinely believe and i know it's not easy when you go through it even for me it's so important for all of us to every now and then not all the time because that would be devastating every now and then fail because yes. when we when we fail that keeps us a grounded you know then we start from scratch and then it pushes us to a corner that we've been uncomfortable with for a long time because everything else has been comfortable, right? So those things are so necessary. And it's so funny you talk about the film that you made about yourself, uh, two of the narrative feature documentaries that I, I made um, uh, simultaneously. And when they were done, I didn't realize, again, same thing happened to me. There was a similar, they're both human rights film, but for the, for the protagonist, they had a similar set of feeling and emotion that I never knew they both had while I was doing it. And it was something that I felt too about something. I mean, it's just so weird how these things are sitting in the back of our head lingering. And then when you watch it on the screen over and over again, when you're editing it or with the editor, it just comes back. Like that's, that's you, that's your story. But yeah, you know, that's in a sense, that's sort of one of the great alchemies of, of motion pictures is that you know you can you see directors primarily directors work you know even if they're working in kind of low budget genre films you know they're paying the bills making whatever their assignments or whatever but their but their personality still comes through you know, and 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 their obsessions and their likes and dislikes and you know neuroses or you know inspirations are all there in in their films, whether they're in this genre or that genre or, or whatever. I mean, one of my favorite filmmakers uh, who's not a director is Val Luton. You know, and he was a producer and he made this series of absolutely sort of fabulous very small budgeted you know b movies uh, rko in the 40s you know cat people and um, bedlam and isle of the dead and i walk with the zombie all these sort of films that have sort of hokey titles but are actually wonderful they're all made by different directors as well but they're all val luton films they're not they're they're certainly more val luton films than they are the director's films and and you can see you know and even if you look at sort of other films that weren't you know, he's most famous for these sort of these kind of um, intellectual psychological horror films. But um, he he did other genres. He did a western called Apache Drums, and he did a historical film called Mademoiselle Fifi, uh, and Youth Youth Runs Wild. You can see him in those films too. So it's clearly him. You know, he is the sort of the auteur more than the director. Um, and these are, low, you know, these are like really small, low budgeted, you know, just filler films, but he elevates them 
you know, by his, you know, his intellect and by by his sort of his good taste and artistic vision. So every one of those films is at the very least really interesting. And some of them are, are absolutely sort of, you know, wonderful, you know, bits of motion picture history and, uh, and have a kind of, have a bizarre transcendent poetry to them that, that you just do not find in, in, in most other films of, of the time period. So what, what, what's his name? Val Luton. V-A-L-U-T-O-N? L-E-U-T-O-N. Go, go find out about Val Luton. There, there's, Martin Scorsese made a, a, a great documentary. I think it was called The Man in the Shadows. Um, I think for TCM, which is terrific. You can, um, a lot of his films have now been remastered on Blu-ray. So they look a lot mm. better. Um, okay. But all of his films are worth watching. I mean, he, his sort of, he did a couple of kind of not so great comedies late in his life, but his RKO low budget horror films, you know, all of those are fantastic. You know, I, I, I think I Walk With a Zombie is, is my favorite. There's, there's something absolutely, truly magical about that, that film. Um, but, but uh, the seventh victim is amazing. I mean, they're all amazing. Go, go, go right. and find out. He's great. I'll check them out. Um, Middle Watch. I I saw it, and you know, thank you for um, so the letting worked. me see. Yeah, it did. <laughs> um, I really liked it. Then I'll tell you the first reaction I had when I saw it, and it, and I'm thinking where have I seen this protagonist? And now this does not mean in any way that it was uh, deliberately or not so, but it reminded me the animation and the style and the character. It reminded me a lot of um, like the old Superman animated series yeah. or the Bat- Batman animated series, and, you know, yeah. that facial structure. And, and even the motion, like I, you know, I just felt that, I don't know, maybe because I haven't seen 2D animation that, you know, in a long time. Uh, it, it was really well done. And the fact, as as most shorts should be, you know, most features should be too, very minimal, not even any dialogue. Um, and I and I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I really, really liked it. So it, it's truly incredible what you, which, the way you executed that with the, with the dark tones and the shadows and everything. Uh, so c- congratulations on that. It's it's a really well. Thank you. The, the congratulations, you know, uh, 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 um, you know, are mostly due to, you know, uh, uh, Aisha Penward, my co-director, and, and Rob Stratton, you know, animation director, and you know, the students at Falmouth University and sure. Arts University of Bournemouth. I I had, I mean, there is there is a sort of a connection between the Fleischer Superman films of the 40s because when I was doing my research into the story, as I said, I found the inspiration for the story online. It's a letter written um, in uh, 1963 to a a magazine called Animals. It's the, if anybody's interested, it's the November 26th issue in 1963 because I have it. It took me a while to actually get hold of that. Uh, original mm. magazine, um, but it was a, it was written in 96. The letter was written in 1963, but it was about an event that happened during the Second World War. Although he doesn't give a precise date, uh, it, it was written by a gentleman called J. D. Starkey, and he the only the only actual hard facts you can find in the letter are that he was serving on an Admiralty trawler, which is a very sort of specific kind of warship with a kind of. It's not a Royal Navy warship. It's sort of a, a, a conversion of a, of a fishing vessel into, you know, uh, um, being either a minesweeper or, or um, uh, searching for submarines. Um, and then he was stationed off the Maldives, uh, you know, um, but it doesn't give a year and it doesn't give the name of the ship because I tried to find more research on it. And without those two details, you know, none of the places I went to um, could actually offer any help, but said, you know, we we have to have one of those pieces of information. We either need to, you know, the year it happened or the name of the ship, and then we could get some more information. So, um, but it was definitely a World War II story. So, when I was trying to think of how 
you know, I knew I wanted it to be hand drawn because that's my first love. And trying to figure out a style, I thought it would be interesting to try and take inspiration from the war artists of the Second World War. And the British war artists of the Second World War, people like Eric Revilius and Barnum Friedman, Paul Nash, Stephen Bone, John Everett, they worked in this very interesting kind of chunky graphic style. Mm -hmm. So even though they were they were tasked with with telling the emotional truth of sort of very devastating and terrible events accurately they didn't do it in a kind of a photo real way they did it in this sort of slightly or very stylized um kind of form and it was at the 1940s sort of style that these people you know had, there's a sort of commonality even though their artistic styles are very different it's kind of sort of chunky and sort of you know uh, uh, and is kind of abstracted so i thought there would be something interesting about trying to do that as the art style for the film, partly, you know, because it is a war story to try and sort of give it some integrity. So using, you know, a style influenced by war artists, hopefully, you know, got you closer to the time period, but maybe also sort of made you sort of subconsciously perhaps believe the integrity of, of, of the art style you know, corresponding to the, the, the fact that it was a story about the Second World War. All right. Um, and you know, and obviously, as the, the Superman films of the Flashes have this, they have a slightly chunky, you know, very young Disney kind of look. You know, re really terrific. I love those Flashes Superman um, things. They weren't a direct influence. The war artists definitely were. I mean, the trick was we didn't want to to take any one artist and try and reproduce them. So we had to sort of synthesize, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know our favorite artists that we you know we were looking at uh, sort of John Everett was very he did a lot of maritime painting so he was very useful for sort of abstracting seas and ships and I think Barnett Friedman we kind of used and, and Eric Villiers may maybe you know sort of some combination for how to handle human beings but really all praise to Aisha Penwarden she she was the one that you know figured out how to a give us the look that was like yes that's the right look and also make it work you know make it you know something it had to be animatable and not just by one person it had to be a, we had sure. it was a different style to work in but but it wasn't enough just to come up with an interesting style it was a it had to be a reproducible style that we could get you know and when we're talking about students we we're not talking about like you know trained professional studio animators were talking about you know third year animation students that we were working with and it was a very challenging style and it was really Rob and Aisha who were this quality control for the for the visuals and made sure that the you know, the look that Aisha and Rob had kind of come up with was was carried through by all the various students because we had students at the University of Falmouth we had students at the uh, Arts University of Bournemouth. We had a, an online Russian animation school. We had students working in in all part, all universities, all on a volunteer basis in in the UK. And it was Aisha and Rob who who made sure that you know that you know the animation style and uh, the character stayed consistent. So you know, all praise to them, not me. Well, team effort, right? Collaboration, and it, um, and where. You know, people can watch this film, and what are you currently working on, if anything? Um, well, it's still Middle Watch is still going through its festival run at the moment. You know, we, as I said, we we got nominated for a BAFTA um, last year, but you know, we've I think we've I can't remember exactly how many festivals we've we've sort of been accepted to e e either. A, to participate and we won in a, a, a few so i think something like 23 and we still have a few more to go so while it's doing its festival run it's not available unless you go to one of those festivals to see it you can't find it you can find the trailer but you won't find the whole film on youtube or vimeo but probably once it's finished its festival run at the end of the year um you know we'll make it available on one of our platform for anybody who who, who wants to see it so um you know in a few months time we should 
you know, once we finished all our festival applications, we'll we'll put it up for people to see. Great, that's fantastic. And anything that you're currently working on, uh, or that yeah, you want to talk I, about? Yeah, I just finished. Um, uh, I've been uh, an episodic director on a new series on the Nickelodeon called Max and the Midnights. Um, which has been really fun and really, you know, interesting to work on. We're using Unreal Engine, you know, um, and we go straight to um, shooting in Unreal without going to storyboards first. So that was mm -hmm. a whole new way of working that I hadn't um, ever done before, you know, and I, I am sure that it will become the norm going forward. It's a great way of working. I, I was terrified of it to start off with because it was so different to anything I'd been doing of my you know, career, you know, and then within a, a few days of working, you know, with it, I was like, wow, this is great. This is, this is the way to do it. Uh, for television, I don't, I don't know about movies, but for TV, it makes complete sense to me. Um, it's much more like shooting live action than it is animation, weirdly, because you go on a digital set, you do a yeah. location scout, you look around, you decide, okay, well, let's use, we'll shoot here, and then you, you, um, uh, you know, you block the action um, as you would with actors on a live action set, and then you shoot coverage, you know, in a way that you would never do in, in animation, um, and uh, and then you know. It, and for, for the editor, it's much more like, uh, you know, uh, sort of cutting a, a live action um, a TV show or a feature than it is, you know, cutting animation where, you know, you only have one angle, you know, I, I, I cover the hell out of things. So you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I provide my editor with, you know, so much coverage, you know, that I know if the, the scene should be bulletproof because I've, I've got it covered you know, every which way you know, from sundown. Um, I love working that way. I think I think Unreal is amazing, and for 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 working and um, uh, and I know Unreal is not the only uh, you know kind of tool like that, but we were using Unreal and it was great for us. Uh, and I really like it. And I think I think the show is actually a terrific show. It's, it's sort of it's a combination of I know, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, and Game of Thrones. You know, for kids. You know, it's sort of medieval. Lord of the Rings type um, uh, fantasy with monsters and comedy, so you know, ticked all my boxes. So it's been really fun um, to work on, um, and you know, I don't know when it will air on on Nickelodeon. Maybe later this year, maybe early next year. Um, so that's, I've literally just finished wrapping the. Um, I was one of three directors. Uh, um, um, Michael Lewis and Kirk Thatcher and I were the three directors. We each did six episodes each, um, and, uh, and it was a twenty-episode run. So David Skelly, who's the one of the EPs, um, of Sharon Flynn, and, and um, uh, Chris Perry who was the uh, supervising director. They they directed the first two episodes, and then Kirk, Michael, and I did did you know did a rotation doing six episodes each. And I sure. just finished my last day was last Friday in season one. So a nice little break for you. And yeah, so now it's now I'm waking up with like, oh, what, what the hell do I do now? I mean, I'm having a having the the summer off, and then we'll see what happens come fall. Good. Maybe you'll make another middle watch type film. Who knows? Maybe you'll get. Yeah, who idea. knows? I mean, I never <laughs> say never. I mean, it, it took a it took a lot. I mean, you know, we you know it was. Um, because we had no money, we had no budget. It was all, it was a entirely all volunteer project. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if I've got the energy to, to do that again, or at least not right, mm. not right now. I mean, we only just finished it in summer 22, you know, uh, making, making a short film, you know, with, with no resources is, is extremely it's challenging. Hard. Yeah, and we, it did is. During COVID, we, you know, we did it during COVID. So, um, that made it even more uh, challenging, but, but you know, who knows? Maybe I'll get inspired with another thing at some point and have enough energy to go. Okay, let's give yeah, world. no. Well, I mean, you have an entire summer to watch a lot of movies because this this year, I finally feel after a long time, I feel like a proper summer movie blockbuster. Um, you know, just 
Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible was a great film. Then you have Oppenheimer, Barbie, Beast, TMNT. Beast, Dead Reckoning. Uh, part one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it last week. It was. It oh, was, you. It was. You, it was and it's good. It, I'm gonna see it next week. I, all I'll say is watch it in the biggest crowd, uh, screen with the fullest crowd. I mean, which it will be anyways, but it, it's a great film. Okay. It's a great film. I'm, I, 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 I'm, uh, I'm a BAFTA member, so I've got a, an invitation to a BAFTA screening on the Paramount lot, you know, next week. So uh, there you uh, go. Perfect. I, you know, that's a very nice theater to see things in. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Go on. No, that's it. You know, so I'm looking forward to that. You know, I, I, I mean, those movies are. Uh, I, I'm a, you know, look, any 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 time I know that's really happening in front of, you know, that's that's a real human being doing crazy stuff, and you know, for real in the real world, and not a bunch of pixels doing it. You know, you got my attention, and and you know, all the Mission Impossible films with, you know the stunts and the action scenes and Tom Cruise doing stuff that, you know, no human being in their right mind should do, but, you know, absolutely. I'm, I'm there. Yeah. And he, the great thing I love about the guy is that I was talking, I was reviewing the film with a journalist this morning on the podcast. And I mean, we all know him about preparing and all that stuff, you know, in the last five, six, seven years, but he made his, he made a very small appearance of the Francis Ford Coppola film in the 1980 or 81 based. Uh, it was based on a book called Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that film or read that book. Uh, yeah. He had a small role, like as one of the gang members. And even for that small role to make sure he looked authentic, the guy didn't take shower for eight weeks. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's just, it's insane how, his mindset is completely different and that's why he's tom cruise that's why he is the way he is you know i mean the, you know i honestly believe if you're going to be a success of whatever it is that you you choose there can be no plan b 100 you know? you cannot have plan b because if you have plan b you're not gonna you will not make plan a <laughs> well <laughs> Schwarzenegger said it really, really well, and I've I've adapted to that. Uh, I've adopted that to the, you know, in my life, is that if you have Plan B, then you know in the back of your mind there's a safety net, and you will not take chances on the Plan A, and yeah, that's exactly. that's it. You can't do you can't have Plan B. You no, cannot. You can't have it. And and clearly Tom Cruise has never had Plan B. There's only <laughs> ever been Tom Cruise's Plan A, and he's just gone all in on that and you know and you, there must be some horrifying picture of tom cruise up in the attic like the picture of dorian gray because you know i'm i'm you know, I, I, i'm in my 60s i don't freaking look like that you know i'm 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 overweight and bald and you know <laughs> look like an old shoe and <laughs> tom cruise doesn't look any different it's 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 infuriating. Anyway, I think he's incredible. Nah, I, I, I mean, we all have special things that others don't, so I wouldn't count yourself out of that. I mean, there's, I'm <laughs> sure, you, you, I'm yeah. sure there are things that you are incredibly amazing at that nobody else is. So you know, we should be. Uh, everybody's different. Everybody's got different thing going yeah. on, and. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Look, I, I will be very excited to see Dead Reckoning Part Part One. Yeah, yeah it, it, enjoy it. Um, and I'm looking forward to Christopher Nolan film as well, and yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. That looks actually surprisingly good. I love yeah. the animation stuff. I'm really, I'm thrilled. You know, and maybe it's because of the success of you know, uh, you know, um, Into the Spider Verse that, yeah. that at least some studios are taking a chance on 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 sort of breaking out of that kind of Pixarian kind of family you know cg look which i am utterly utterly sick of and same here uh, same here and and just seeing you know that kind of kind of grungy sort of look they've chosen for you know teenage mutant ninja turtle without knowing anything about the movie but i'm just like well god bless at least you're, you know you're trying something different and new it looks cool and i hope the movie's great i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna go see that because i, I want to see how that style works and um, you know, I, I I hope that you know 
I thought both the Spider-Verse films were fantastic and I thought they were both visually amazing and the fact that you know a big studio took a took a huge swing and and connected and succeeded you know and 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 they were big successes I hope is inspirational to other studios to to try and do more interesting things with animation as you know because it should be the most interesting and flexible and imaginative of art forms and it's kind of it kind of felt for a while that it got boxed up at least at least in terms of major studio output into a very samey, you know, slick but not very interesting kind of look. And, and so any any films that challenge that um, uh, get my vote. I, I'm, I'm the executive producer on Australian um, film called Scary Girl, which is based on uh, Nathan Jurvis's um, vinyl toys and graphic novel, which has a very strong and distinct look you know which you either like or you won't it's 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 not trying to please everybody but i you know i'm very proud to be you know um an ep on that movie and you know i'm trying to champion that and get it made for the last 10 years with sophie byrne and passion pictures in australia because i just wanted to see something that was in nathan's world and that just looked different to you know, Disney and Pixar stuff. And um, uh, that'll, you know, that's just had its premiere in Australia. And, you know, really pleased with how much movie, you know, uh, we got for not very much money. I got to check that out. I'm just looking at the poster. It looks interesting. Is it already out or? It, did, it, it had its premiere at the Sydney Film Festival or something like a week or two weeks ago. I okay. don't know if any, um theatrical distribution deals set for it yet you know uh, uh so hopefully everybody will get the chance to see it it's it's a very different kind of film you know uh, you'll i really like it because it's of all its differences your mileage may vary but at least it's different yeah no i'm 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 really excited i just looked at the poster and i'm already i'm already excited about well, it so mine and and uh you know uh, check the trailer out you know that'll give you a it, i think it they i think they did a great job of of, of you know and, and nathan was very sort of closely involved in making sure it looked like his stuff um but you know for the, for the sort of pretty modest budget um we had to work with i think it did an amazing job of making it look like nathan's art which was the whole point yeah Great. No, I'm excited. I'll, I'll check it out and uh, uh, we'll keep you in the loop about things and we'll stay in touch. Yes, please do. It's, it's always fun talking with you. And you know, if next time you're in LA, we'll go out and get you know, a beer and some food and chat more. We'll definitely get some food. I don't drink. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we'll get some food. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Beer, we'll get some food. But uh, but yeah no uh, I, I I would love to and uh, let me know how you like Mission Impossible I'd be interested. Okay, all right, man. I will I look care, forward buddy. to that. Look forward to speaking to Thank you again soon. Take care. Okay, like bye. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment, and do come back for another episode. Until then, have a great day.